I'm going to share my experience using this in angle closure patients. So the one word that you're going to most commonly hear this academy meeting is mix, especially if you're a glaucoma surgeon or even if you're a cataract surgeon. That's one of the most common words that you're going to use, going to hear, mix, mix, mix. What is it? Is it's a minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And fortunately, most of it is going to be focused on open angle glaucoma. So I had the opportunity to try this KDB blade since last one year, since last October, and my patients are predominantly angle closure patients. And I had also had an opportunity to work with one of my colleagues from Vietnam, Dr. Uh, Tam from Ho Chi Minh City. She's doing this KDB blade in chronic angle closure patients in pseudophagic eyes. Unfortunately, I don't have the data, but I'm just going to share my experience and my pilot data with you all. So, this is my typical work schedule. If you see, on an average, like any of you, I do like eight to 10 cataract surgeries with glaucoma combined. But if it were to be 1997, when I was a fellow, almost 90 to 90% of them will be something like this, trabeclectomy. So that was the only thing that you know, we had during that time, and I was doing my fellowship in 1997. But now, everything is changing. What's happening is, if you see to the extreme right, hab internal techniques. Hab internal techniques, that's what we are trying to focus now, is focusing on cataract surgery. And at the same time, if you can do something for this glaucoma patients, especially if they are in mild to moderate uh, glaucoma. So this hab internal technique is, as defined, is at least modest efficacy that is sustained, extremely high safety profile, and rapid recovery with minimal impact on quality of life. But as I was telling you, most of them are ab internal, and you're going to focus on the angle. When you look at the angle, when, like, you know, when we are trying to do this, it's not going to be easy, especially if the angles are closed. If you see this angle, this is an high-definition OCT, where it actually shows the structures where you have to like, pinpoint to do these procedures. If you see from the scleral spur to the shunt, you know, to the end of the Schwalbe's lane, it's just only 500 microns, trabecular meshwork. And this is where you are going to focus on doing all these procedures. So if you are not precise when you're actually doing this, you might make a big mistake and your outcome might not be as good as you thought it might be. So this is my colleague, Doug Johnson from Mayo Clinic. So, you know, in open angle glaucoma, we, we all thought the actual pathology is happening juxtacanicular or towards the... Uh, trabecular meshwork. And this is, again, a lot of studies have been done on this. But what happens is when you do all this procedure, say, Schrems canal-based surgery or canal-based surgery, you're forgetting the trabecular meshwork. What happens when you do all these procedures, the trabecular meshwork actually go, goes into some sort of like a fibrosis, and that blocks the efficacy of these procedures. So what happens? You have to think beyond the trabecular meshwork, what really is happening. Say so trabecular meshwork is connected just behind us is the Schrems canal, which is like almost like 350 microns, and from there is the collector channels. So the pathology is from the trabecular meshwork, Schrems canal, and the collector channels. So there is a blockade in each step. So this is the picture of open angle. So what happens in angle closure? There is one more blockade there the itis. So if you want to do all this mixed procedure and other things where you are focusing on the angles, in angle closure glaucoma, this is not going to be easy for you. Why? Because the iris, this is like a the rich four-point classification where the blockade can be at the iris in relative pupillary block where it can be 90% of the patients or in the ciliary body or it could be due to lens related or even due to aqueous misdirections. All this pathology what happens is the iris is moved more forward and then it blocks the drainage system. So if you want to access this 500 micron of the anatomical structure where you want to do all the structural changes, it's not going to work very well. Why? Because you need to actually see the structures. So this is one of the you know, technique that was done in 1999. Bob Rich and Chaiwat actually did this in angle closure patients. What they did is this is a gonia cynicalysis. It's done by 26 gauge needle. You just use a 26 gauge needle bender and then go to the angles and you actually see the 
structures there where there is the PAS that's kind of like completely adherent, you're just going and mechanically removing the, uh, the iris from the trabecular meshwork. This is the gonia cynaculosis. And they kind of like looked into the uh, patients, almost like uh, 52 eyes in 48 uh, patients, and they had a good outcome, especially if the patients had acute angle closure in the past six months. So this is what you're focusing, the PAS. So this is the study that I quoted, like this is in ophthalmology, published in ophthalmology in 1999. He had a good outcome because I did a fellowship with them in 2005. I was kind of like intrigued. I worked as a technician for some time doing all the UBMs. I would have done like 300 UBMs in, uh, in one year. So the next step. So the first step is actually removing the structural blockade that's there, the iris that's kind of stuck to the trabecular meshwork. The next step is what we are doing is the goniotomy. This is the mother of all mix. So in my hands, if you see, especially in pediatric glaucoma, like if you can do this well, especially in clear cornea, if you can do this, even after years after the child comes back, this is one of the best surgeries that I've seen in my hands, especially when I'm doing my pediatric glaucoma fellowship. In 1997, even if I go back to India, like when I'm seeing these children, they're like doing great. So there is some pathology that's happening there that you open up and then it starts working. So two steps, one is the iris, the second step is the goniotomy. So the Kahoot blade is the blend of two. So it's basically you're trying to break the iris that's kind of stuck to the, uh, the trabecular meshwork. The next step is if you can actually see to access the trabecular meshwork, you're going in to remove the trabecular meshwork. So two steps that you can accomplish with this. So a Mayo Clinic, this has been there for, since the last 30 years, but the primary Mayo Clinic has been there for more than 150 years. So this is a study that we, since last October, I've been doing it. 32 patients diagnosed with angle closure. All of them got a UBM and ASOCT data to diagnose what is the kind of uh, angle closure they have. Three to nine months of data. And, you know, predominantly Caucasian population. Unfortunately, like, uh, it's almost like, 74% of them are Caucasians. And then we looked into the imaging data to diagnose what is the kind of angle closure they have. Typically, like, you know, uh, they had relative pupillary block, they had an, uh, uh, laser iridotomy in all these patients where the angles opened up a little bit, but still they had a PAS. And the other causes are phacomorphic. You can see that 22% of them, since they are older patients, and 4% had plateau eyes syndrome. So the first step that you do in all these patients is like, you know, you have to do a thorough gonioscopy to examine where exactly the PAS is. Unfortunately, if you see the four quadrants in angles, the superior angle is the most narrowest of all, and that's where the PAS happens. If you have any imaging that you can access to, like a new BM or an anterosegment OCT, just use it, use it to supplement your findings of gonioscopy. Otherwise, you have to take back your gonioscopy and start doing it. If you're going to do this in the operating room, better learn this in the uh, office setting and then actually see where exactly you're going to focus on doing the surgery. So this is, these are all the, uh, these are some uh, surgical tips how actually like you are going to uh, do this procedure. You know, after doing a thorough gonioscopy in the office, if you're actually doing this, if it's a pseudofakic eye, sometimes I use a pilocarpine or use a myostat at the end of the case so that the pupil kind of constricts a little bit. And something like a very similar technique that's known as a shock cell technique, where you use a viscodispersive at the end of the angles and a much more cohesive near the center so that it kind of causes some sort of like attraction and pull, pulls the iris out. So basically when you're using this blade, you're going from the periphery where you can actually see the angles and then go take out the goniosynaculosis and then go much more deeper to take out the trabecular meshwork. And of course, these are some tips. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not going to go deeper into this. And uh, different views. This is for Paul Palmberg, you know, die bomber's view and then missile view. Like uh, this is where exactly what you want is the structures that you're going to address, it should be exactly perpendicular. When you're doing this gonioscopy intraoperative and you're doing the structure analysis, I want you to like make sure that you have the nearest axis and then go ahead and take out. Again, these are the two steps I was talking about. And then if you can, what you have to do is basically go to the structures. And if you don't see the PAS, 
use this code are much more coercive and then see that if you can pull the iris down a little bit and then see where exactly you can see the shem scan and then just go from the seeing part and then move it to lice the angles and then move forward. And I know this is uh, John's video. This is, it's, this is simple, like, you know, but when you see this, it's not as simple as it, you think it is. I'm, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but you need to, you know, it, it goes really smoothly, but you need to have a little bit of training. And if it's an open angle, it's like, yeah, it's very smooth. But if you have an angle closure, it's not going to be as easy as it is. Because I trained some of the surgeons in Vietnam or Skype. And in Vietnam, they have a typically a really brown iris with fully closed angles. And you know, when they tried, this is, these are some videos, they actually said these are the problems they had. One of the major problems is bleeding. So you know, it can come out of the eye and then it can actually obscure the view. And you, you have difficulty. So like, basically what you're trying to do is you have to make sure you, ha you do proper visco tamponade at the angles and also at the where the uh, incisions are made. And this is again uh, bleeding at the trabecular meshwork. And you know, they've been having a lot of issues, especially when you lice the angles, we'll have difficulty doing this. And then of course, like Leo showed some uh, techniques how to remove the trabecular meshwork once you make the cut. It's, we use the uh, forceps or even the IA cannula, it comes out. So why does the bleeding happens? Like you have to be a little careful. One is the PAS that kind of like breaks down. The other one is like when you actually go and cut the uh, trabecular meshwork, sometimes you actually going out the uh, Sherm's canal too. So when there is a reflex, but there is a pressure gradient from the venous system to the anterior chamber, the blood is going to reflex back into the anterior chamber. So this is a small uh, data, like over six months to nine months. You, you see predominant, you know, pre-op it's almost like 48 in trabecular pressures. Of, this is because uh, almost 40% of my patients had uh, acute angle closure. And like it, it's been like last six months, they're, they're doing good. What we need is, we need long-term follow-up of uh, the outcomes. You know, like right now, this is a coordinated effort from Asia that I'm doing. But we need to look into like how, whether there is actually a mix for angle closure or any minimally invasive procedure that we do. Two steps, goniocinecolysis and goniotomy together. And then we need to follow up and then use all the imaging techniques that's available to make sure that when you go into the operating room, you know where you are dealing it, you know, what you're going to deal with.